Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our second evening of the 2022 annual Monroe Musnick Lecture Series. I'm Rabbi Shani Abramowitz, Rabbi at Ojave Zion Synagogue here in Lexington. And it is such a pleasure to be with you all for a second night of wonderful and important learning just in advance of Passover. Our talk for tonight, entitled Avadim Hayinu, an intersectional Jewish perspective on diversity and solidarity, will again be delivered by Dr. Amanda Mabuvi. And as somebody who is fairly new to the rabbinate and someone who is also fairly new to Lexington, I am delighted that this important lecture series exists and proud to be part of a community that values these kinds of conversations. The Musnick family established this lecture series years ago as an opportunity for interfaith dialogue specifically with the goal of educating Christians and the broader Lexington community about Judaism and Jewish scholarship. The Musnick Lecture Series is a joint effort of Transylvania University, Temple Adith Israel, Ojave Zion Synagogue, and the Lexington Theological Seminary. In past years, the Musnick has welcomed such speakers as Rabbi Dr. Mira Wasserman and Dr. Susanna Heschel. A quick thank you to everybody who helped make tonight possible. To our partners at Transy, Dr. Carol Barnsley, Dr. Leslie Ribovich, Charlene Harris, Julie Martinez. To our partners at Lexington Theological Seminary, Reverend Dr. Lloyda Martell. And to our partners from the Lexington Jewish community, Dr. Beth Goldstein, Dr. Nora Musnick, and Rabbi David Werchafter. And now to introduce our speaker. Dr. Amanda Mabuvi is a scholar of Hebrew Bible, author and teacher with a wellspring of academic administrative and nonprofit leadership experience. As Vice President for Academic Affairs at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in Philadelphia, Mabuvi oversees the academic program and a curriculum that combines rigorous academic learning with intensive community building and field training. Mabuvi subscribes to a holistic approach to rabbinic education, one that equips students to bring about new possibilities for the world. Mabuvi is the first Jew of color to lead an American rabbinical school. She is dedicated to further increasing diversity within the rabbinate and ensuring that the profession more accurately reflects the full human diversity of Jewish communities that students and graduates serve. She says, what has guided me is a desire to change how we think about and live with diversity in ways that lean into our fundamental interdependence. Mubuvi thinks about diversity in ways that are flexible rather than rigid and that celebrate connection across difference. As a scholar and teacher of the Hebrew Bible, she recalls being drawn to its vivid stories, rich language, and the ways ancient texts connected with various streams of her identity. In addition to numerous scholarly articles, Mabuvi is the author of the 2016 book, Belonging in Genesis, Biblical Israel and the, Politi the Politics excuse me, of Identity Formation, published by Baylor University Press. Most recently, Dr. Mabuvi served as assistant professor of religion at High Point University in North Carolina. She has taught courses in the Hebrew prophets, the five books of Moses, global perspectives in biblical interpretation, women in the Bible, storytelling and the sacred and introduction to Judaism. She was also taught at Elon University, Guilford College, Duke University Divinity School and Rank Theological College in South Sudan. In addition to her academic work, Mabuvi has coordinated an adult literacy program in North Carolina, served on the board of Beth David Synagogue and the B'nai Shalom Day School in Greensboro, North Carolina, and is a former member of the Jewish Community Relations Committee of the Greensboro Jewish Federation. She also spearheaded the creation of High Point University's first minor in Jewish studies. She serves on the board of the Society for Jewish Ethics and was a program chair for its annual meeting in 2019 through 21. Dr. Mabuvi earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy and literary theory from Bryn Mawr College, a master of theological studies degree from Palmer Theological Seminary, and both a PhD in religion and a certificate in nonprofit management from Duke University. Just a couple housekeeping notes, please direct your questions to the Q&A box. Um, there's also closed captioning available for this webinar that you are able to use throughout. Our webinar for tonight is gonna to be recorded and will be available on Transy's YouTube channel in the coming days. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amanda Mabuvi this evening.
Thank you. It's great to be with you this evening, many of you again this evening. Um, I'm excited to have some time with you and to delve into these topics with you. I really appreciate your interest in uh, thinking about diversity and Judaism from all these different angles. So those of us who were, with, who were together last night, we focused on a children's book. Today, we're getting into Passover and into the book of Exodus. So we're moving through time. So I'll go ahead and get us started. Okay, so the, the title of tonight's lecture is Avadim Hayinu, An Intersectional Jewish Perspective on Diversity and Solidarity. This lecture is going to focus on the idea of solidarity as developed by the Book of Exodus and appropriated through the holiday of Passover, looking at both individual and communal dimensions and relating the dynamics of intergroup relations to the dynamics of living out individual membership in the Jewish people. And um, for tonight, since we're looking at the book of Exodus, I'm going to be talking about B'nai Yisrael, which is the phrase often translated as the children of Israel. Uh, like the Passover Seder, this lecture will move from the present moment to the ancient past, grounding personal experience and collective memory. It uses hybrid Jewish identities to illuminate the intersectionality involved in living out Jewish tradition in a world based on a different set of values. Recognizing this intersectionality, I'm gonna argue, is what provides the impetus for developing diverse alliances. So Passover, Passover commemorates the exodus from Egyptian slavery to a life of freedom as the people of God. The central observance of the holiday is the Seder. The commemoration of the exodus is so important that Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg has argued that it seems to take precedent even over the event itself. Plans for the, plans for the commemoration begin before the people have even left Egypt, suggesting that it happened so that we can talk about it. And we talk about it in a very particular way, seeing ourselves as personally coming out of Egypt. The Exodus is not something that happened a long time ago to other people. It's something that is current for each of us. And so for that reason, we say, Avadim Hayinu, we have been slaves. The grammar of Avadim Hayinu designates a very precise relationship between the speaker and the experience of slavery. Ancient Hebrew verbs have something called aspect rather than tense. They don't situate actions in accordance with time as a stream that flows only one way from the past to the future. Rather, in a way, kind of like the two versions of the past tense in Spanish, they invoke actions as complete or as incomplete in their entirety or um, ongoing. So translators who are rendering ancient Hebrew into English, they often try to make it work with English by relating certain verbs to the past tense and other verbs to the present tense or to the future. But to fully appreciate the richness of the phrase avadim hayinu, we really need to try to enter into the temporality of ancient Hebrew. So when I'm talking about this, I like to think about um, a timeline. So if we think about, um, a timeline like this to look at kind of the normal way we think about time moving with linear progression. Um, this is kind of one way of thinking about time, kind of moving from 2012 to 2017, everything in order, here are the different things that happen. But when we think about in the book of Exodus, a meeting on Mount Sinai between Moses and the transcendent God, um, it didn't occur at a particular spot on the timeline. Instead, it was a moment in which all of Jewish history was contained. And I like to express that visually. Um, if we think about that timeline written on a piece of paper, here we've got it all folded up. So, so we see these individual events all stacked on top of each other because we've taken the timeline and we fold it on top of itself. And then we poke a pencil right through it so that this arrow that's going through is touching every moment in time at the same time. Um, that it's not just kind of one thing after the other, but it's all of it all at once all together. And the phrase of Aidim Hayinu really partakes of this sense of the richness of time in which moments overflow the boundaries of linear sequence to create an expanded present. It invokes the past that is as fully with us as any contemporary occurrence. And in so doing, it identifies us as people with intimate experience of oppression while also calling us to live into the new reality of liberation. In this way, it empowers us to reach out in solidarity with all with empathy for all who suffer while guarding against a perpetual victimhood that neglects such privileges as we may have attained, demonizes our adversaries or relegates the suffering of others to the background of our own. 
So when we say avadim hayinu, we refuse to let the experience of slavery fade into the background as we develop a sense of self rooted in growing prosperity. We all remain first generation refugees. In this way, the Seder does not just highlight or even illustrate the moment of its origin. It constitutes a kind of embodied storytelling through which the Jewish people is constituted across space and time. And we are constituted in relation to the experience of being Avadim. In keeping with that experience of identification with the outsider, we have a special sensitivity to the word we. Our experience with universals teaches us that they generally don't include us, and it's an exclusion that always threatens to spill over into violence. The book of Exodus presents the conflict between God and Pharaoh as a conflict between visions of the world with differing ideas about what it means to be authentically human. Um, as conceptualized by Judaism and by Christianity, being authentically human refers to living into a kind of spiritual wholeness and health that fulfills the intention of the existence of the human species. In the book of Exodus, this notion of authentic humanity comes up against an alternative represented by and centered on Pharaoh. Rather than distinguishing between better and worse ways of living into one's humanity, Pharaoh's version distinguishes between those humans who count and those who matter less or not at all. It attributes authentic humanity only to a select group, applying different rules to those within that group and those without. Um, so the opening words of the book of Exodus, and these are the, name, and these are the names of B'nai Yisrael, they introduce more than just the list of personal names that immediately follows. They also introduce the competing descriptions of the people that feature prominently in the conflict between God and Pharaoh. The Hebrew name for the book of Exodus is Shemot, which means names. Like all titles of ancient Hebrew texts, it comes from the opening words of the book. naming in the post-colonial sense, where people have layered names that reflect the fissures through which individuals constitute themselves amidst externally imposed definitions that circumscribe their relationship to their ancestors and that resituate them in another regime of identity, where names already communicate the, the conflict between cultures that people live in the middle of. Um, verses in, in Exodus, verses 1, 7 to 8, introduce the central conflict of the book. So in keeping with the description of blessedness in Genesis, B'nai Israel have been fruitful and multiplied during their time in Egypt. But the new Pharaoh doesn't know what to make of this development. In the richly, lexi richly laid in lexicon of Genesis and Exodus, the explanation that Pharaoh didn't know Joseph has a layer of meaning beyond just explaining why Joseph's prominence no longer proves advantageous to his family. Joseph's name reflects his mother's wish that God would continue to transform her barrenness into fruitfulness. The association of Joseph with fertility is reinforced in Jacob's Testament, in which he calls his son a fruitful branch, beset by adversaries, but blessed by the God of his ancestors. Thus, the reference to Pharaoh not knowing Joseph has is not just a reference to an individual that Pharaoh is not acquainted with. It signals that Pharaoh has no familiarity with the view of creation in which the blessedness of B'nai Israel is situated as a vehicle of blessing to all the families of the earth. And there I'm referencing Genesis 12, 1 to 3. So this Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph sets out his worldview in the first words that he speaks. Speaking to his people, he announces, look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them so that they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. Lacking the view of interconnectedness that Genesis presents as structure and creation and relationships therein, Pharaoh distinguishes sharply between his people and the people B'nai Israel, depicting the prosperity of one as a threat to the other. He uses us to activate a group that designates B'nai Israel as outsiders, calling on that us to take action against the threat. Pharaoh's people respond by pressing B'nai Israel into service. Notably, the text depiction of this action focuses not on the fact of enslavement, but on the creation of a hierarchical structure to enforce the servitude and on its oppressive purpose. So to quote from Exodus, so they set taskmasters, taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. 
and they built garrison cities for Pharaoh. B'nai Yisrael literally build the apparatus of oppression who used to keep them in check. For all its efficiency, okay, um, let's look at this so far. Um, for all its efficiency, the action of Pharaoh's people against B'nai Yisrael nevertheless produces unintended consequences. The more, but the more they were oppressed, the more they increased and spread out so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. B'nai Israel live out the saying, we don't die, we multiply. Meanwhile, Pharaoh's people view them with the particular dismay that we reserve for and to the God who speaks creation into existence, a parallel highlighted by Yocheved's response to the birth of Moses, Yocheved, Moses' mother. In an echo of God's response to creation in Genesis, all through Genesis chapter one, she saw that he was good in Hebrew, Kitov. This recognition accompanies her decision to defy Pharaoh's order and hide him. Get that next, yep, okay. Yeah. So to kind of see visually the contrast between God's view of authentic humanity and Pharaoh's view of authentic humanity. These parallels use the language of Genesis to juxtapose two conceptions of B'nai Israel held by two people within the same society. Exodus revisits and remixes elements from Genesis with words and images associated with creation appearing in a different light. Accordingly, readers trained by Genesis will recognize its interconnected vision of blessed life in the descriptions of B'nai Israel in, in Exodus. There's so many linguistic echoes that readers while steeped in Genesis will, will notice that and make the connection between those texts. But in Pharaoh's world of competition, those same features lead to the characterization of B'nai Israel as pests. So as distinct as these two worldviews are, it's important to recognize that the two groups do not exist in simple binary opposition. The people who live with these ways of conceptualizing and constituting community are not neatly sorted into one camp or another. And that point is really illustrated well by the ambiguity around the identity of the midwives the text talks about Shifra and Pua as midwives to the Hebrews, but it doesn't really resolve the question if they themselves are Hebrew or if they're Egyptians who work with Hebrew, who work with Hebrews. Regardless of the answer, um, they, like everyone in the book, are impacted by both the exercise of power from Pharaoh and the power of God. They receive Pharaoh's command to kill Hebrew babies, and they must answer to him when they don't comply because they have chosen a course of action rooted in fear of God rather than fear of Pharaoh. By prominently featuring this choice by midwives who are Egyptian or who even might be, Exodus foregrounds the questions of where the Egyptians will find blessing, as people of this Pharaoh or as people of God. The midwives and the only gradually emerging distinction between B'nai Israel and the rest of Egypt in the series of plagues underscores this point. Exodus does not depict a conflict between two groups, but rather between two sources of authority promoting different conceptions of solidarity. Everyone must choose which call they will hear in wrong direction. Oh, I got to that yet, okay. Even those who are part of B'nai Israel can opt for Pharaoh's way of interpreting the world rather than that of Genesis, as illustrated by the various ways of characterizing the mixed multitude that went up with B'nai Israel from Egypt. Commentators frequently distinguish the mixed multitude from B'nai Israel proper, sometimes dispassionately and sometimes taking a very negative view of the multitude. In Hebrew, the phrase mixed multitude, the Rav Rav, resembles the name for the fourth plague, Arov. Um, the same consonants. The same, some of the ancient sages saw this parallel as indicating that the mixed multitude constituted a kind of cancer on the people. And so they blamed this group for instigating all the negative episodes in the wilderness. So from that perspective, the series of punishments serves to cleanse the people by expunging those who were never really Israelites. The fourth plague is interesting. There's kind of a mystery about it. It's, it's named by an unusual word that's, whose meaning cannot really be definitively established. There are long traditions that understand it as referring to either wild beasts or an insect swarm, some variety of unpleasant melange. Um, it's notable though that mixture serves as a distinguishing feature of the plague. 
Because if you think about it, someone being attacked by wild animals, they might be expected to focus on their fearsomeness or someone facing insects might be talking about their ubiquity or their discomfort or the disease that they bring. And in neither case of wild beasts or insects does diversity seem like it would rank high on the list of concerns. So the use of this word rather than more common words lends some weight to the, to the parallel usage for the mixed multitude. But I think we can read the linguistic link between the plague and the multitude in the opposite direction from the way that the sages use it to condemn the multitude. Following the pattern where the same words have different meanings for the people of Pharaoh and the people of God, the use of the same word, the same root, would indicate that the diversity experienced as a plague by the people of Pharaoh does not present a problem to the people of God and may even be a source of strength. The solidarity between B'nai Israel and the mixed multitude reflects their common plight, but to fully leverage that commonality, it requires more than a shared dislike of being oppressed. For the Exodus to accomplish more than creating a new version of Pharaoh's dominion with different people in charge, it has to be accompanied by an embrace of an alternative version, an alternative vision of authentic humanity. In Exodus, that alternative is God's vision of what I like to call blessed interdependence. Genesis presents that vision as part and parcel of creation, predating the particular existence of B'nai Israel. The alliance with the mixed multitude illustrates the potential of partnerships that go beyond the covenantal particulars that constitute B'nai Israel's distinctive identity. So it's a model, what we see with the, with the mixed multitude, of what it means to be in solidarity um, that goes beyond the distinct identity of being B'nai Israel, sort of vision of being in partnership and working together. The Torah itself does not refer to the mixed multitude again, which could mean that they maintained a separate existence and went on to their separate destiny, or it could mean that joining the Exodus led to their becoming part of B'nai Israel. My goal here is not to try to settle this as a matter of interpretation or to pass judgment on other interpreters. Rather, thinking about Exodus in the spirit of the holiday of Pesach or Passover, I'm examining the kind of solidarity created when we say avadim hayinu. When we see ourselves in the Exodus story, it means that we who partake in the Seder have to choose different ways of understanding what it means to be an us and how we fit into the world. Identifying with or alongside B'nai Israel means that we choose the Genesis vision of, of blessed interdependence. Or more accurately, we choose the process of finding our way into that vision, even as it cuts against the grain of our experience in a world ruled, ruled by Pharaoh and his competitive view of identity and difference. In the book of names, identity is a matter of contention. Familiarity gives, ex in the book of names, I'm referring to Exodus by its Hebrew title, which, which means names. Um, familiarity makes Exodus seem inevitable. You know, the things that happen, it seems like, of course, they're going to happen that way. And it, it can make us overlook a lot of the ambiguities and the tensions that are in the book. But Exodus is actually as full of drama as any reality show, as people work out who they are and to whom they belong. Um, go through and going through this process of becoming the people of God. The Passover Seder carries this idea forward, presenting identity as a product of performance. On the one hand, our participation in B'nai Israel brings us to the table. At the same time, as we engage the story, we become B'nai Israel, as dramatized in the Seder's four children. So we have some readers who will read these for us. What does he say? What are the testimonies, the laws and judgments that the Lord God of us commanded you follow? It falls upon you to guide him through all the obligations of Pesach, including it is forbidden to eat anything after the Passover meal. Thank you. Next. The wicked one, what does he say? What does this type of worship mean to you? To you and not to him. And by divorcing himself from the community, he denies our very essence. Moreover, you must blunt the bite of his words by telling him, for this purpose, the Lord labored on my behalf by taking me out of Egypt, for me and not for him. Had he been there, he would stand undelivered. Thank you. What does he say? What is this? And say to him, with the strength of a mighty hand, we were delivered from Egypt, the house of servitude. Thank you. And finally. 
You should open up the story for him, as it is said. And on that day, tell your son, saying, for this purpose, the Lord labored on my behalf by taking me out of Egypt. Thank you. Thanks, readers. So in keeping with the biblical emphasis on revealing character through dialogue, each of these children is characterized through, wor through their words or their lack thereof. The importance of this story to membership and community comes through most pointedly in The Wicked Child. And I should admit here, this, this translation here is from um, Nathan Englander's New American Haggadah, but I changed, he has the evil one and I prefer wicked, so I changed that word. But there are other things about this translation that I really like. Um, so it comes through most pointedly in The Wicked Child who dissociates themselves from the performance of the Passover story and thereby from B'nai Israel. This very carefully nuanced translation at the end here, um, had he been there, he would stand undelivered. It recognizes that when an individual within B'nai Israel rejects identifying with that community, the result is a redemption emptied of substance. One may stand outside of Egypt, but nevertheless stand undelivered as reflected in the wish to return to Egypt, frequently articulated um, in the book of Numbers. The characterization of such a person as wicked underscores the way in which solidarity with B'nai Israel it provides the basis for living into the community's ethical vision. It's not a dismissive condemnation rooted in a demand for allegiance or loyalty for its own sake. Rejecting one's membership in B'nai Israel places the wicked one outside the community's ethical system. The, Pesach, the Passover ritual of recreating identity through performance reveals that B'nai Israel is an identity that cannot be reduced to an inert product of birth, but who's one whose embrace reconstitutes us as ethical subjects. So rather than looking at the Haggadah's four children as representing different kinds of people present in the community, there's one popular line of interpretation that looks at them as representing different tendencies within the individual, within one individual. And that interpretation accords well with the Avadim Hayinu declaration that we have been slaves to Pharaoh. Although some popular retellings of the Exodus story end once the people have left Egypt, the biblical book of Exodus depicts a movement of B'nai Israel from being Avadim of Pharaoh to Avadim of God. So on the one hand, different translations of that word Avadim highlight the word's different implications. Living as the Avadim or slaves of Pharaoh was a dehumanizing experience while living as Avadim worshipers of God draws the people into a new way of life in which they most fully realize what it means to be authentically human. At the same time, the use of the same word to describe both relationships illustrates the direct competition between the way of life rooted in Pharaoh's conception of authentic humanity and the way of life rooted in God's. So in this sense, we, when we affirm that we have been Avadim to Pharaoh, we also acknowledge having been captive to his way of looking at the world. And it's an ideological allegiance that's broken only through God's liberating action. So like the experience of socioeconomic subjugation, the tendency towards Pharaoh's worldview remains within us, but does not define us. The depiction of Moses in the book of Exodus complements the dueling, depictures of, dueling depictions of B'nai Israel by demonstrating on an individual level, the complexity of taking on the identity of B'nai Israel. Commentators often interpret Moses' reluctance to take on the assignment at the burning bush as reflecting some sort of speech impediment. But there's, I think there's good reason to consider that his concern may not have been with his faculty of speech per se, but with his ability to speak for a group with whom he has a fractured history. So like a transracial adoptee, Moses is born to Hebrews, but raised by an Egyptian princess. So when God addresses Moses from the burning bush and refers to your ancestors, it's not obvious who God's talking to. Um, as an adoptee and an emigre living with his wife's family, Moses may not know which ancestors are meant without further clarification. References to familiar, familial relationships are so common in the biblical text that it's easy to overlook the, the nuances of these terms in the life of Moses. The text reports that Moses grew up and went out to his brothers and saw their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew, one of his brothers. This narration, the way, the, the way that Exodus describes this, it's notable for its mention of discovery. While brothers are usually those with whom we share daily life in the most intimate way, Moses had to go out to see his brothers and the conditions in which they live. This complex relationship is reflected in 
the response to his intervention in a dispute among Hebrews. One of them says, who made you a chief and judge over us? Do you mean to murder me like you murdered the Egyptian? This rebuttal highlights Moses's marginality with respect to both his Hebrew ancestry and his Egyptian privilege. When Pharaoh hears about it, he seeks to kill Moses, either because Moses has killed a man or because his expression of solidarity with oppressed Hebrews has called into question his loyalty, revoking the privilege of his adoption by Pharaoh's daughter and reinstating the death sentence that he escaped at birth. Fleeing Pharaoh, Rose, Moses arrives in Midian where the locals immediately recognize him as an Egyptian. This identification highlights the, the way in which social categorization really changes from context to context. People see the distinctions that have social significance and fail to see the, the, those that don't. So that the distinction that Pharaoh makes between his people and B'nai Israel that plays such, an, such a big role in daily life in Egypt turns out to be meaningless once they're out of, once Moses is out of Egypt. People aren't, can't even tell the difference between those groups of people. In the encounter at the burning bush, God also points out to Moses the holiness of the place where he is standing and instructs him on the appropriate behavior. We can read this as God guiding Moses in relating to a lineage that he may not know how to embody. Like a person participating in an unfamiliar tradition, Moses needs to be briefed on the protocol. You kneel when, bow, what, what? Um, this, this can be Moses getting that kind of advice. So accordingly, when God announces the plan to free B'nai Israel from Egypt, Moses' first response is to proclaim his own inadequacy, not as someone prone to personal insecurity, but someone as someone in the throes of racial imposter syndrome, when people are wrestling with the tension between their conception of a group that they supposedly belong to and their experience of themselves. So echoing the question that someone else posed to him in his unsuccessful mediation attempt, he asks, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring B'nai Israel out from Egypt? Moses then points out that he's unprepared to answer even the most basic question about B'nai Israel's God, whose name he doesn't even know. The reader may look at God's response as a moment of special revelation in which God's name is first revealed, but for all that Moses knows, it's an embarrassing admission of ignorance. Um, for all he knows, this information about God is common knowledge among the people with whom on the journey. God will be with Moses and Moses will bring the people to worship God at this mountain. This response resembles the call of Abram Abraham in Genesis 12 in that each of them gets called into identi an identity that best characterized as being the one with God, an identity that also entails occupying a liminal space in regard to conventional kinds of identity. God calls both Abraham and Moses to live against the grain of their experience and into a self that is not a natural fit. And in this, they model something that's central to the identity of B'nai Israel. Occupying this liminal position leads Moses to a distinctive way of being in the world. Moses' passion for justice develops naturally as a consequence of his intersectional identity. The combination of privilege and marginality produces a, a particular relationship to justice because having privilege leads one to expect justice but marginality means that on a regular basis, one will experience or closely observe injustice. So Moses's kind of special sensitivity to injustice, we can relate that to the fractures of his, of his identity, showing the relationship between his identity, um, conceptions of solidarity and ethical behavior. The very background that prompts Moses to question his fitness to bring the people out of Egypt turns out to equip him in a special way for the particular form of, Egypt, of leadership to which God calls him. Brokering the Exodus is just the beginning. The larger task is to bring the people to a new land and a new way of life rooted in covenant with God. Moses' lack of cultural competence, so his self-description when he says, I'm not a, a words guy, um, it, it goes beyond just words. It provides a good foundation for his role as a lawgiver precisely because the typical patterns of thought and behavior of the people don't come naturally to him. In his hybridity, he occupies a kind of cultural wilderness adjacent to many territories, but not fully contained with any of them. Lacking words of his own, he's well positioned to bring B'nai Israel into the wilderness to receive new words from God, a point powerfully made when he gives voice to the book of Deuteronomy, whose Hebrew name is words. 
By almost any measure, Moses is exceptional, setting him apart from the rest of B'nai Israel, but also making him an apt model for this people called to be exceptional and to maintain a distinctive way of life. A mixed multitude of an individual, he demonstrates that the specificity of being B'nai Israel does not necessarily entail exclusivity. His heterogeneous background does not preclude him from prophetic leadership. Indeed, it plays a positive role, such as when his Midianite father-in-law guides Moses to a more sustainable leadership structure. Even when Moses' background or responses to it produce instability, it nevertheless plays a constructive role in God's plan. Um, and I wanna conclude with a special note for Gentile Christians um, in light of the, the community gathered for this talk. So Gentile Christians are like the mixed multitude brought into the people of God, um, being part of a community that has its own larger history. The book of Romans uses, the New Testament book of Romans uses the image of being grafted into the olive tree that is Israel. And think about the difference between that image and the way that Christians often treat Israel, like the picture that came, into, into, came in the frame they just bought. You know, you go to Target, you buy a picture frame, there's a picture of people in there, you take that out, you throw it away, you put your picture in. Um, I think there's a tendency to think about Israel that way. It's sort of like your ad here, just stick yourself in there. Pharaoh's mistake begins with forgetting Joseph. When we forget our history, when we stop seeing other people and the way our lives are bound up with theirs, that's when it becomes easy to get into that competition mindset and to see others as a threat to our prosperity. So um, I encourage Gentile Christians, hear your own story in Exodus and recognize the power of God that you've experienced. But don't forget the people with whom you are identifying, who even today suffer hate crimes at the hands of people who have co-opted their history. Remember the work of God that has enabled you to share in their story and let God's inclusion inspire your own. Okay, stop there and we'll take questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Mabubi. I'm happy to um, take a look at our Q&A. Uh, so Bruce Engel asked a question. Can we look at it this way? Pharaoh is stuck in a zero sum game. Either we prosper or you prosper. On the other hand, God would say we could all prosper through blessed interdependence. Yes, exactly. Um, I think that's exactly right. And, and I'll give you a little background on this phrase, blessed interdependence. If we, um, if we look at Genesis and creation in Genesis, God creates various things and blesses things. And so when, for example, when people get the blessing to be fruitful and multiply, that's not the first blessing that God gives. So what's happening in Genesis is not God like blesses animals and, oh no, just kidding, people. I mean people, that the, the blessing that people get um, finds its meaning in relation to the blessings that other parts of creation have received. And so in being connected to one another and sort of finding our blessedness is something that comes through that connection and not through competition. Thank you. I, I have a question. I'm happy to, to jump in with my own question. Um, so I, this phrase, Avadim Hayinu, right? We were slaves, um, also draws on the, the sort of mythic quality of the Exodus story, um, the mythic, origin story that the Jewish people have of, you know, enduring slavery in Egypt, coming out of slavery, being liberated. Um, and I'm curious just to hear your thoughts on how having a, a very deep visceral connection to that narrative, even though it's mythic, can help us in Jewish community and interfaith community engage more authentically in anti-racism work and the search for blessed interdependence and authentic humanity. Mm, okay, thanks. Yeah, this, this is a great question. Um, yeah, there's, there's so much here. So one thing I'll say about myth is I think myth gets a bad rap um, in contemporary ways of talking. So as, as a scholar of religion, I wanted to point out that the, the sort of way we're used to myth as being kind of myth means something that's false. Um, it's like myth versus fact or something like that. Um, it really diminishes the significance of what a myth is. It's not sort of a, a fake story or a, a simple story that people believed before they had better scientific knowledge. It's a story whose point is to talk about the meaning of human experience and, and to make sense of the world. So it's not trying to, it, it's, try, it's, it's a story that's focused its communication and its purpose on that deeper meaning level. 
Um, so it's not about sort of taking it literally. Our society, um, and I guess we have been for a while now, um, we're very obsessed with what I like to call security camera truth. Like if there had been a camera, a video camera, what would it have picked up? What would it have picked up happening in that moment? Um, and most people in most times and places have not been as focused on that kind of truth. Um, but this idea of, and this is something I like to think about with in, in relation to the Bible overall, but this idea of finding meaning and purpose and identity in engagement with a story um, is I think something that's very continuous um, with us and, and people in other times and places. So in terms of kind of how our connection to this story can help us think about anti-racist work, um, I think there's a lot in there. I think first of all, um, going back to the grammar part, that very precise, we have been slaves, that it owns the experience, but it doesn't, it, it makes the experience present, but it also doesn't deny other aspects of our present experience. It doesn't deny the sort of change in, in our position from that moment to this. It sort of, it encompasses the fullness of what our experience, and I'm not assuming that, that all Jews have the same social experience, people are all over the place, um, but it, it invites us to kind of live with what's wherever we are and to step into this history that we are sort of carrying with us and holding onto as being formative. Um, so I think being able to see both sides of that, the sort of the present circumstances that one's in and the choice to hold on to and identify with that identity of having been slaves, um, both of those parts are very important to be able to be engaged in that work. Um, because it's important to, to care and recognize a sense of common purpose and connection, um, but to also realize that um, to be flexible and, and to be able to see all of history and not just thousands of years ago and not noticing anything in between. Um, I think the other piece of it is that this idea, you know, going back to this idea of well, we don't just want Pharaoh's dominion with different people in charge, but we actually want to have a different way of thinking about the world. That one of the things we can get from this story is a different way of thinking about the world. So not just to sort of say, well, racism is bad and what we're doing is bad, we should do something else. Um, because um, parents, I'll say other parents, you'll know what I'm talking about here, when you see something your own parents did and you think, I don't wanna do that. And one of the things that I think is so important and often missing sometimes um, in justice work is not just to talk about what we don't like, but to talk about what we wanna build instead to have that positive vision um, and to hold on to it and to articulate it and to be inspired by it. And I think that's something that we can get from this story. Um, thinking about interconnection, thinking about um, being in coalition and partnerships that may be rooted, that we may be drawn to as Jews, but other people may be drawn to out of other reasons, um, that there's a vision um, that incorporates everyone. Um, and also, um, also this idea that really like we are interdependent, that our well-being is connected to other people's well-being. It really is. And I think that's one thing that I hope we, we're learning in this pandemic. Sometimes it's a little scary even how we're learning it, but that we really are like we will not move forward as long as we leave people, keep leaving people behind. Thank you. We have some more questions in the chat uh, um, from Rabbi David Weschafter. Uh, one question is, Eric Ward had said that Charlottesville, now Pittsburgh, demonstrates that Jews are situationally white. Uh, what can Moses's being situationally Egyptian teach European Jews about situ being situationally white? And a follow-up question, how can we go beyond replicating exclusive dominion to forming blessed independence here in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things I think is really interesting about that is the way that so many of the challenges that we face now 
that seems so distinctly contemporary and it seemed to be so much a product of our particular history in this moment in time are actually mirrored in biblical texts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a lot there. I think, I think one of the biggest things is, is what you've already, you've already articulated in the question, which is that identity isn't absolute. It's not like we just are something and we are that who we are and how we're perceived and what that means changes from place to place. Um, that it means different things in different contexts. Just being able to have a concept of that, I think is very helpful because I think it's, it's a way of thinking that is not common um, to recognize those nuances. And so to look at Moses as a model of kind of living through those nuances, I think there are also a lot of really interesting models in, in Genesis. I always got to go back to Genesis. Um, but looking, for example, the word Hebrews, the way it's used in Exodus to sort of talk about this group of people that is also B'nai Israel that becomes the Jewish people. Um, it, it's not used that way in the, in the book of Genesis, that in Genesis, the word Hebrew is only used when, when the people thus named are talking to outsiders, trying to explain who they are to outsiders. So again, to think about kind of getting rid of the inevitability that people often bring to Bible stories because they're familiar. Um, Abraham gets called by God. God says, go leave your land, leave your father's household, go to the land that I'll show you. So God calls Abraham away from everything that would have given him his social definition. And, and here's the kicker, what God's replacing it with is not specified. It doesn't say you're not going to be this, this, but that you were, you're going to be this other thing. It's like, go, I'm going to show you. And so that's, you know, why I was talking about the identity of sort of being with God. So if God is sort of founding this new people or peoples from Abraham, it's not like other people know what that is. It's not like when Abraham encounters other people in his life, they're like, oh, I see that you are Still a pretty largest extended family. It's not kind of a full on people. Genesis really kind of stays in that awkward in between space of, Ab of Abraham, kind of on the one hand, having this new identity of God from God that he's still trying to figure out. And on the other hand, people still looking at him the same way they looked at him the day before. And so I think both from Moses and that example, um, the examples that we get from the book of Genesis can really model for us what it means to kind of live between two ways of thinking about who we are, that we can reject all the sort of problematic ideological ways that we think about identity in the society, but that doesn't mean they disappear from the world and no longer matter or that they're not in influencing how other people relate to us. Um, so I think that kind of the change from context to context, and also the living between two, um, the living between two definitions, between this blessed interdependence that God is developing and whatever else everybody else is doing, is also something that's really modeled for us um, in these biblical stories. Um, remind me of the second part of the question. The second part is, how can we go beyond? replicating exclusive dominion to forming blessed interdependence here in America? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this, I guess, in a practical way to sort of distinguish this from what I said before. I think really what we need more than anything else right now is to rebuild the social fabric. We need to rebuild a conception of common humanity. Um, this sense of just being a community. So, and sometimes I think it's not about having the tough conversations. It's about reclaiming a sense of having things in common with people who see the world very differently than we do. Um, I mean, like picking up trash in a park, um, you, know, you know, things like that, things that are just our life together, getting back to that on a very basic fundamental level to kind of rebuild this idea that we, um, that we matter to each other, that we can build a community together, that we can work together for some conception of the common good. 
Um, because I think we've gotten to a point right now where we're so partisan um, when we can't even sort of agree on let's not die from a virus, um, something is really deeply wrong. And so even things that in another time may have seemed kind of objectively unifying when they're not doing that anymore, we really have a lot of work to do to rebuild a basic level of trust and common humanity to be able to work up to, to the bigger challenges that we're facing and that we really need to deal with. Thank you so much. Um, there don't appear to be any more questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I'd like to give it a minute just in case people do, um, but I'm gonna take this opportunity to thank you, Dr. Mbuvi again. Uh, it's been a wonderful couple of days. We have really been enriched with all of your, your thoughts and insights. Uh, it's been two wonderful presentations. And I know that our students who attended yesterday have already been engaged in conversation. And I'm looking forward to, to tomorrow when I'm in class again, and uh, we'll get to, to have uh, more conversations again. There are lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, and I know I've heard from many of my colleagues already. Uh, so once again, thank you very much for, for joining us and being with us and uh, sharing your, your thoughts with us. Thank you for having me. It's been really great to have this time with you. I appreciate your thoughtful questions and, and your, your careful engagement of my work. And I, I really hope that it's helpful for you. Thank you so much.